This has been just a wonderful day. I was so encouraged by Family Friends Day earlier, by the tremendous amount of visitors that we had, some still with us now, and we're thankful for that. But it's been a great encouragement to gather with fellow Christians on this Lord's Day and to enjoy such a wonderful meal. And I want to express appreciation to all of you who prepared that meal. We had a lot of people and needed a whole lot of food. And I was at the end of the line and I still found something to eat. The good thing was this. I had to eat baked chicken instead of fried chicken. Now, I prefer the fried chicken, but I don't need it. I need the baked chicken. So it all worked out well. But we appreciate uh, all those who've been working feverishly, tirelessly for this Vacation Bible School. And what you see behind me is part of that work, but there are some things that are in the process of getting done for Vacation Bible School behind the scenes. And for all of you involved in that, we're so grateful. Remember that we will have an adult class also this week, so if you're not involved in the teaching of Vacation Bible School, come and join us in the adult Bible class and we will be meeting in the chapel hall. Brother Mosier will be uh, teaching the class Monday and Wednesday, and I'll have the privilege of teaching the class on Tuesday. Also, uh, uh, I want to express appreciation to those who uh, had a, a display over in the fellowship hall to allow some of our new members particularly to see some of the works in which we're involved and some of the activities that are upcoming. It allowed our visitors to see that as well. And not everything we're doing was displayed, but some of those things were. And uh, we want our visitors to come in and see that we are a congregation that not only enjoys good fellowship together, but is actively working and serving in the kingdom of our Lord. During this particular month, and this is the last Sunday of the month, the last day of the month, I have been uh, speaking to you on Sunday afternoons Messages from the Psalms. In the four Sundays that I have spoken this month, I have been looking at Psalms that are very special and dear to me. Now all of them are meaningful to you and me. And particularly these four that I have mentioned, I have personally grown because of my study of them. The first that we studied several weeks ago was Psalm 130, a psalm of prayer. And then Psalm 103, a psalm of praise. And then last Lord's Day, Psalm 23, a psalm of promise and protection. But today could very well mean the most to me, Psalm 32, a psalm of pardon. And that's where I want us to spend the next few minutes before we dismiss today studying that beautiful 32nd Psalm penned by the apostle, uh, or rather the, the king of Israel, David, the beloved David. Now, this word pardon, I'll mention this while you're turning to Psalm 32. This word pardon is one that I can remember back to my childhood. I'm sure that I heard preachers preach about, about pardon or forgiveness from sins from the time I first attended the services of the church. But the word pardon became a term of, of national significance back in the 1970s because of some notable pardons. And the news would be on and I would hear this word pardon, someone being pardoned for the possibility of having committed a crime. Uh, the first time I can recall that would have been in the early 1970s when and the first time in U.S. history, a president resigned. President Nixon resigned from office. And then his successor, President Ford, uh, offered a pardon. If President Nixon committed any crimes, he would not have to undergo any kind of trial. He received an executive pardon. Now what happens with any of these pardons that uh, are extended by president, great controversy surrounds it. Some, for example, might say, well, President Ford is right. We need to, to move on, and we need to put this behind us, and the best way to do that is just to pardon the former president. Let him get on with his life. As a nation, we need to move forward. But others would say, no, 
If he committed crimes, he needs to be held accountable. So great controversy surrounding that. And then uh, a few years after that, there was a young lady named Patty Hearst who was pardoned by then-President Jimmy Carter. There was a lot of controversy surrounding that particular pardon. Now, Patty Hearst was the heiress of a newspaper empire. And so she was kidnapped uh, before 1977, I think probably around 75, 74, 75. She was kidnapped by a terrorist group, and they held her hostage for quite some time. But there was also video coverage of her engaged in crimes along with that terrorist group. And so some said she's part of them, she's guilty. Others said no. They brainwashed her. They took her against her will. And it was President Carter's decision to issue a pardon to Patty Hearst. But again, very controversial. Down through history, presidents have taken advantage of this authority they have to issue pardons, but it always comes with much controversy. Now, sometimes a person probably should receive a pardon. And sometimes a person perhaps should not receive a pardon. But I'm going to tell you, this pardon we're talking about this afternoon, none of us deserve. But it's granted. And for that, we are very, very thankful. King David needed to receive a divine pardon for a heinous crime he had done in the sight of the Almighty. The background to this psalm is 2 Samuel 11 and 12. And you know, you know the story. You know that King David, the man who at one time had been identified as a man after God's own heart, sinned grievously in the sight of God. This man sought after a beautiful woman by the name of Bathsheba. He had her brought to the palace, and there he engaged in adultery with this woman Bathsheba. He then sent her back home, and King David therefore wanted to put this behind him. He engaged in a sinful act, but who knows about it? Well, one did know about it, right? And the one who knew about it was the one that he was accountable and that was God himself. I don't know what overcame David. If he really thought as the king that he could get by with this, if he had the right to do this, but uh, most likely what overcame David was what overcomes a lot of men. He became very lustful in his heart. He looked upon this beautiful woman, and instead of leaving the scene and going back to his business or praying diligently that the temptation might, uh, might leave him, he fell headlong in sin and then tried to do what? Cover it up. And that's where the problem really did begin when he tried to cover it up. Bathsheba lets him know she's expecting a child. He knows it's his. For her very noble husband, Uriah, had been out on the battlefield fighting the enemy. David, instead of being the leader he should have been, was there relaxing and reclining on the rooftop when he saw Bathsheba when he committed that grievous sin, not just against Bathsheba, not just against himself, but against Uriah, but also against his family, and likewise the people, and above all, God. And so David tries to keep this quiet, and so he brings Uriah back to his house, but the noble Uriah would not go in unto his wife, and so finally David would have Uriah killed. Now, surely then, he has covered his tracks. Everything's going to be okay. But in 2 Samuel 11, we read how that the thing that he did greatly displeased the Lord. The Lord still knew about it. And later God would send his man, Nathan, Nathan the prophet, to King David. King David was in a position of influence and power. He was the king of God's people. That could not just be pushed under the rug, so to say. Nathan the prophet was sent to King David. And he told him a story to bring to his conscience, to bring to his memory, to his mind, what had resulted earlier. And so King David understood through the story that was told by Nathan the prophet that he was the one who was guilty. He was really the point of the story. And so King David, fortunately, confessed his sin then. He realized when Nathan looked him in the eye and said, Thou art the man, you're the one this story is about. 
You took something that did not belong to you. You're the one that I'm talking about. When he did that, he repented. That's all there was left to do. Sometimes we get in a situation where all that we can do is travel that difficult pathway called repentance. But that's the pathway we have to trod if we're going to get right with God. And here is the beautiful confession of King David. As he thinks about his sin and acknowledges it, he recognizes he has received a significant pardon from on high. Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man unto whom the Lord imputeth not iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no guile. When a man has been pardoned from his sin, there is contentment. That's the first point. There is contentment. Blessed is such a man whose transgression is forgiven, and whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man unto whom the Lord imputeth not iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no guile. Blessed, happy is such a one. Jesus speaks in the Sermon on the Mount about certain uh, beatitudes that we are to find in our own lives. Happy or blessed is the man that doeth these things. The things Jesus said we ought to do are rather indifferent to the world. They don't understand it. But we understand it. Blessed is the one, for example, who mourns over his sins. Jesus says he'll have mercy. He will be comforted. And so blessed is this one, happy is the one whose transgression is, is uh, forgiven. Now these words here that are used are interesting to understand. Transgression, for example, is that which is rebellion against God's rightful authority. The psalmist said, Blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven. Now keep in mind that the reason that God forgives these transgressions is because God is merciful. There are some things that God would rather do than other things. For example, God would rather forgive sin than to exact judgment. James 2.13, His mercy rejoiceth against judgment. So if you're understanding God and you know something about His character, you'll know that, that it is God's desire to pardon. God desires to forgive if we will put ourselves in a position whereby He can forgive us. But He forgives transgressions. Transgression, denying God's rightful authority or His ownership in my life. That's what happened at the beginning of time. Adam gave the allegiance that rightfully belonged to God and willfully and deliberately gave it to the devil, to the one it did not belong. And therefore he transgressed God's law. Transgression, 1 John 3, 4, sin is transgression of the law, going against that which God has said is right. When we read that word forgive, what does that mean? He's lifted something off of our shoulders. He's carried something away, something far from us. As the psalmist would state in Psalm 103, as far as the east is from the west, he forgives us our transgressions. He takes them away. But then the psalmist said, the one who's blessed or happy is the one whose sin is covered. What is sin but a failure to live up to God's particular standard? We sometimes say it's missing the mark. God has set a particular standard for us to follow. When we fall short of that, what have we done? We've sinned, and thus we put ourselves in need of God's forgiveness. So to cover sin means to conceal it so that that sin will no longer appear. And that's what happens when God forgives. Transgression is forgiven. It's, those sins are carried away. And likewise, our sins are covered. And that which covers our sins, 1 John 1, 7 and 9, is the blood of Jesus. But then he also says in Psalm 32, Blessed is the man unto whom the Lord imputeth not iniquity. God imputeth not iniquity. Iniquity. All that is, that is wicked and vile in the sight of God. Blessed is that man. God does not impute iniquity. Now we know there are a whole lot of crimes committed today against the God of heaven and against humanity that are vile and wicked and um, evil in nature. But when we read this word imputeth, imputeth not, 
That means that God does not charge up certain sins to the account of some individuals. Well, who could that be? Over in Romans chapter 4, notice that Paul, in that particular passage, quotes uh, David when he's speaking about the faith of Abraham. In Romans chapter 4, beginning in verse 2, For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory, but not before God. For what saith the Scripture, Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Then look at verse 6. Even as David also describeth the blessedness of the man, unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works, saying, Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven, and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. And so someone asked the question, Are you saying that there is a man out there who God does, mark, does not mark up sin against? No, I didn't say that. That's what David said. And that's what Paul said. Two men who by experience understood what that meant. Who is the one that God will not impute iniquity? It is the one whose transgression has been forgiven, the one whose sins are covered. They are not held against him anymore. And isn't that the good news of the gospel of Christ? Blessed is such a man that when God looks upon him, he is forgiven, he is cleansed, he is justified in the sight of the Almighty. So we find in the opening verses of Psalm 32 the contentment of a pardoned man. But there's something else we need to notice in the passage. And that is the confession of the pardoned man. Look at verse 3. When I kept silence, my bones waxed old through my roaring all the day long. For day and night thy hand was heavy upon me. My moisture is turned into the drought of summer. I acknowledge my sin unto thee, and mine iniquity have I not hid. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord, and thou forgivest the iniquity of my sin. Oh, the pitiful poet in this particular passage. He says, I must confess my sins before God. Now, Nathan convinced him that he needed to confess these sins. I am convinced that prior to this, David had, had many long nights. There are those who refuse to confess sin, who know that's exactly what they should do, but don't do it. And as a result, are miserable. David says, I can't even sleep at night. And I know now why I've not been able to sleep, because he was guilty before God. Nathan brought David to the point where David said, I've got to confess this to God. There very well could be, dear friends, brothers and sisters in Christ, a reason you're not able to sleep, a reason you can't be positive and optimistic. It may be because there is unconfessed sin in your life of which you need to address. David, he could pray to God. He was God's child, but he was far from him when he committed adultery with Bathsheba, and remained far from him until he confessed his sin. And so I think probably there were several ways he tried to overcome uh, his sense of guilt. There are many today that try to overcome guilt in various ways. Some will just deny the things that take place in their lives. Just try to deny it. Others want to try to hide their sins. Still there are others who who want to laugh their sins away. But some of those who may be laughing on the outside aren't laughing on the inside. That's the problem. And so we see in this passage the burden of unconfessed sins. David says it's like rottening bones. My unconfessed sins make me feel as if my bones are rotting. The grief of his sin robbed him of his strength. Not only that, in verse 4 he says, I feel the heavy hand of God upon me. For day and night thy hand was heavy upon me. What is that? That's a guilty conscience, isn't it? You see, there are some who engage in that which is, which is wicked and vile and evil and have no, have no problem whatsoever sleeping at night because they really do not have God in their consciousness. It's different for you and me. <laughs> The Word of God is in us. That seed is there. 
It causes us to discern, distinguish between the good and the evil, the right and the wrong. And when I go against my conscience, can't sleep at night. I remember that my granddaddy used to like to tease my grandmother. My grandmother would work on crossword puzzles and things of that nature well into the night. My granddaddy, as soon as his head hit the pillow, he went to sleep. My grandmother said, I just can't understand how you just roll over and your head hits the pillow. He says, good conscience. <laughs> she didn't like to hear that. By the way, my grandmother was a good woman. I don't believe that was her problem. She just couldn't sleep. But, uh, but my grandfather would tease her about that. He says, good conscience. I can go to sleep. And so, David, I believe, had many restless nights because of his sin and because of his refusal to take that to God and seek forgiveness. Not only that, his vitality was sapped. He said, my moisture is turned into the drought of summer. Here is a man in a pathetic state, simply he, because he will not acknowledge his sin and confess his sin unto the God of heaven. I don't know why he would not do that. But I do know this. When a child of God is burdened with unconfessed sin, he becomes one of the most miserable people on the face of the earth. At this particular time in his life, before he confessed his sin, David was miserable. What did he have to do? Look at verse 5. He said, I acknowledge my sin unto thee. Oh, what a release that is. There is the acknowledgement of sin. David had to confess the fact of his sin. Somebody says, well, what if there's some sin in my past and I never took it to God and I can't remember what it is? Well, pray that way. Lord, no doubt there are things in my past I can't even remember where I offended you. Forgive me. What if I can remember it? Then name it. David named it. He said, I know exactly what it is that has hindered my relationship with God. I acknowledge my sin before you. If we say we have no sin, John says, we deceive ourselves. The truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. 1 John 1, 8 and, and 9. Oh, be very careful that you don't become self-righteous and be able to point out all the faults of others without seeing your own. I need to remember that message as well. Let's be able to acknowledge our own personal sins. And that's what David did. You see, some sins we commit are in our own minds. I don't have to go confessing those sins to everybody else, but they still need to be confessed to someone. To whom? The one who knows them. The one who knows them. So everybody doesn't know the sin you perhaps have committed, but God does. What David did, he tried to keep hidden from others, and maybe many did not know what he had done, but God did. And therefore he had to acknowledge his sin before God. Not only was there an acknowledgement, there was an uncovering. Look, he said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord, and thou forgavest the iniquity of my sin. David chose not to conceal or hide anything from the Lord any longer. Now what did Adam do when he said he tried to run from God? What did Jonah do when he would not do what God told him to do? Tried to run from God, but it didn't work. And so here is David acknowledging his sin and uncovering them. Here they are, Lord. I lay them out there before the one who knows everything. God says, I already knew, but I was just waiting for you to tell me. I was waiting for you to acknowledge it. Sometimes we as parents are like this. We know the crime committed, but isn't it sweet when a child will come to us without us having to, to urge them to repentance or urge them to confess it? with tears in the eyes and say, here's what I did. I like to hear a child be truthful. God likes to hear his children be truthful, to be honest. Don't try to hide it. He acknowledged his sin. There was an uncovering of this sin and confession was made. David says, Nathan is right. I am to blame. Against thee and thee only, David would write, I have sinned against God. All sin ultimately is against God. And therefore he confessed it as so. And he asked God to forgive him. Why didn't he do that in the first place? Why didn't he just do that in the first place? 
When's the best time to confess a sin? Right after you've committed it. Sure, we understand that if we can avoid sin, that's wonderful, but sometimes we sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. The truth is not in us. Sometimes we do. Here we see the importance of confessing our sins quickly, to stay in proper fellowship with God. He might have said, well, I'm going to let God cool down just a little bit. <laughs> it doesn't work that way with God. Cool down? I don't know that God has to cool down. His temperament is always the same. But God also remembers. He does not have a, a faulty memory. I can remember when I was a boy hearing my mother in the privacy of our home speak with disgust about a certain lady in town that she said went into another home and disrupted that home and took the husband away from the legitimate wife. Now, my mother was not saying that the man didn't have a role to play in that, but she had little respect for this woman. This woman and this man would marry and have their own children. And some years later, I remember hearing my mother say, I can't believe this, but this year she's mother of the year. And I just picked up on these conversations. What was my mother talking about? Everybody had forgotten, hadn't they? They put that to the past. So she messed up a home. So she took a man away from his, his, his first wife, legitimate wife. That's past. We've forgotten. But I learned even then, God hasn't forgotten. And if she's still in that relationship today, it's as fresh on God's mind as it was back then. Still is. David could have thought that. But his sin was on his record. And until he acknowledged his sin, God could not forgive him. Satan's clever, though. Satan can put a guilt trip on people that's different from the guilt trip God puts on people. When God makes us feel guilty, it's to push us toward him to make things right. Satan says, you see what you've done. <laughs> Satan doesn't mind saying to any of us, God's holy. <laughs> oh, you could never please him. My, you better just forget God. Don't think you could ever receive forgiveness from a holy God. But the truth is we can receive forgiveness. The truth is God wants us to confess our sin. He perhaps wants us to acknowledge our sin more than we desire to acknowledge it because He knows what He'll do when we confess it. As His children, He'll forgive. He anxiously awaits to forgive. He's the father of Luke, uh, the father of the boy in Luke 15, the prodigal who ran away every day. That man had that boy in his prayers. Every day he looked across the horizon to see if this is the day he's coming home. And when he did, he ran to meet him. The only time you see a picture of God running is to meet the prodigal, is to meet his lost son. So quickly, quickly confess your sin when they are committed and seek God's forgiveness. Because listen to this marvelous statement found in Isaiah chapter 55, verse 7. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return unto the Lord, and he will have mercy upon him, and to our God, here it is, for he will abundantly pardon. David is talking about a glorious pardon here in Psalm 32 that he doesn't deserve, but that God is ready to extend. Now notice something else in the psalm. Now notice the commitment that David makes. There's contentment, because he made his confession. There is that confession, which is an acknowledgement. That confession leads him to make this commitment. And this confession that he makes to the Lord is not one of mere lip service. True penitence is found here in the heart of David. You see, his life was transformed because of God's forgiveness. Now here's what happens to a forgiven man. A forgiven man urges others to get right with God. Look at verse 6. For this shall every one that is godly pray unto thee in a time when thou mayest be found. I take from that passage that David says, I'm going to encourage everybody I know to confess their sins and get right with God. 
In this passage, he recognizes God's protection. He says in uh, verse 6, Surely in the floods of great waters they shall not come nigh unto him. He says, now that I'm back in a right relationship with God, I am fully armed and protected. He says in verse 9, he's not like an animal that has to be trained. He says, be not as the horse or as the mule which have no understanding, whose mouth must be held in with bit and, brittle and bridle. He says, lest they come near unto thee. David says that he has learned to behave himself through this awful, awful period of time in his life. Here's a man who's now back on track. And in this psalm, he shouts for joy because of his forgiveness, because of his pardon. And that brings us to the fourth point of the message. In this glorious pardon, we see a great contrast. Verse 10, the final, verse, the final two verses of of uh, Psalm 32, verses 10 and 11. Many sorrows shall be to the wicked, but he that trusteth in the Lord, mercy shall compass him about. Be glad in the Lord, and rejoice ye righteous, and shout for joy, all ye that are upright in heart. Notice the contrast that he makes there. A contrast between the wicked man and the forgiven man. Notice over in Proverbs chapter 28, a passage you ought to write it down in the margin of your Bible. But this is something we need to think about and often. Verse 13 of Proverbs 28, He that covereth his sins shall not prosper, but whoso confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy. Either our sins are pardoned in Christ or they're punished in hell, but they're not overlooked. And God says, I want to forgive you. I want to offer you a pardon. David confessed his sin. He shows us how to do that. And I'm so glad that he confessed his sin. I'm glad he confessed his sin because what would have happened had he not confessed his sin? You know what Nathan said to David after David acknowledged his sin? He said, because of this, you will not die. That's frightening, isn't it? Unconfessed sin leads to death. Because you've confessed your sin, because you've acknowledged your sin, you're not going to die. Had David refused to have done this, he was going to die. I believe that what Nathan is saying, had David not acknowledged his sin right then at that moment, he would have died very soon. But physical death comes to those who will not confess their sins, as does spiritual death. Physical and spiritual, the result of sin. Spiritual death comes to all those who refuse to acknowledge and confess their sins and have their sins forgiven in God's appointed way. And so this is a psalm that offers much peace and comfort. But there's that contrast that stands so vividly in this passage. Here's what happens when we don't. And so this afternoon, obey the simple gospel if you've not done so. A penitent child of God can come home right now through acknowledgement of sin and asking God to forgive. If need be, we'll pray with you. You just come and let us know how we can help you. And the one outside of Christ needs to obey the gospel by repenting of sin confessing the sweet name of Jesus and being baptized into Christ for the forgiveness of sins. So available to all of us this day is the glorious pardon that David received. If only we will do what we need to do with regard to our sins. Won't you come? Let's stand and sing.